I love doing webinars. They excite me. So a little bit about me. So I'm Adrian. I am a mom of now four teenagers. Um, and I um, have a very large house. And for those who've been in to my home, you will know I have a lot of stuff. And one of the things that my business is about is um, we run businesses and each business has a system. You get a job description, you get all those kind of things, but we don't implement that same system into the smooth running of a home. And that's what I am helping people learn how to do, um, whether they're doing it by watching webinars like this or working with me, either one. Um, it's systemizing your home, making a home somewhere where you actually want to be. So my training is actually as a nurse. So um, environments are very important in nursing. Um, and I will explain how that works with, with clutter. And it's just, it's so important to us to look at our spaces and to change because coming home from, if you're working at home or if you're coming in from outside job and you walk in your house, you should want to walk into your home and just be able to just relax instead of walk in and more tension because there's just so much everything everywhere. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, share my screen. I have a presentation. The, I will put up a link um, after the talk. It's a 30 minute free session. It's not to win, anybody can book it. And all it is is a session where after this, you will have some questions you want to answer and you'd like more detail, then that's what it is for. It's a question and answer session. So um, we're going to do that now. So I'm going to go into my screen and share it with you. Um, slideshow. Okay, sorry. Computer is slow. It needs decluttering. So. Right. So simple ways to declutter your life. Um, our home is supposed to be our sanctuary. It's supposed to be a place of repose and rest. Um, and often, you know, we look at magazines and we see these perfect homes and beautiful surfaces and everything's in order. And we like look at it and go, but I've got kids, it's not gonna happen. And it doesn't have to be like that. We don't all have to live in these magazine worthy homes. We need to live in homes that are suitable for our lives, that fit our lifestyle and the way of life we want to lead. So we're gonna start. The first thing is, is it actually clutter? A lot of us have um, collectibles. You've got glass cabinets with displays and stuff. Well, is there clutter? The truth is, if it's organized, if it's in the right place, you know, the saying there is a place for everything and everything in its place, if that's how it is working, then that's not always clutter. Clutter is a different thing to different people. So if you're a minimalist, anything can be considered clutter. But if you're somebody who wants a home that looks lived in or that is lived in, then you're going to have different things lying around your house and it's not always clutter. Now, the thing with clutter is clutter actually affects every single part of your house and your life. You may not know it because you know, you just get used to it. But um, I was speaking to somebody who does like Reiki and Feng Shui and clearing. And she says the clutter collects stagnant energy in your home. And it actually prevents you from moving forward with whatever it is. And it doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be a small step of moving forward, just getting rid of some stuff, hanging on to the past. Now there's necessary clutter and there's junk clutter. And for everybody, that is different. The saying, uh, one man's junk is another man's treasure is very true here. So for me, I have over 200 cookbooks. Somebody else would consider that clutter. Since I make my life, you know, I live for meal planning and cooking and helping other people plan their meals. I actually use those books. So they're not clutter because they're getting used. On the other hand, um, and for this is especially for the men. If you do not have a box of wires and plugs of some sort, you haven't lived. Okay. Every home I've ever been into, there is a box of those things. 
and nobody wants to get rid of them in case they can use those cables again. So um, I'm not sure how many people here have um, manuals for things you don't need anymore or don't have or don't work. Uh, cables for cell phones that are long gone. Uh, ear, well, these earphones that come with your earphones that come with your phone. Every time you get a new phone, you get a new set of earphones. So how many of those have you got? So that's what I'm really talking about. Things that are no longer necessary, but they're not broken, so you're not going to get rid of them. Um, you know, and we hang on to stuff like that. So clutter actually affects your health as well. It's not only your physical health, it affects your mental health. And there are two reasons for this. And one of them is walking in causes stress. And that picture, by the way, is, well, was my actual front door, okay? As you walked into the house for three weeks, that's all I saw because I was trying to declutter the entire house. And those were all the children's books. Now, at the time of the photo, um, and you'll see those are kiddies books, my youngest was 16. Um, so yeah, it took me a while to get rid of them. So please know that clutter has been linked to depression, both as a cause of depression and caused by depression. So the first one is it causes depression. Like I said, walking into that front door every day just made me want to turn around and go home, go back to work because at least at work, my office was kind of tidy and it looked good. And it was just more airy and more spacious, and yet it was half the size. But also when people are depressed, they don't have the energy to get up and to start moving and things build up, you know, um, books next to your bed. It's a simple thing, especially if you've been sick for a while and you, you're starting to feel depression. When you've got babies, um, that exhaustion is actually a form of depression, but most of us are able to just work through it as the babies get older, but it does stop you moving forward and it does stop you clearing out the stuff. Your past also has a huge impact on how you have your home, how much stuff you have in your home. So it can be your, you grew up extremely poor, let's say. So when you get things, you don't want to get rid of them because you've been taught in the past, you might be able to reuse that or you may need that again, or it might not be available again to you because you won't have the money to replace it. So you hold on to stuff like that. Another thing could be um, a terrible tragedy or something like that where say, God forbid, a robbery or a fire has destroyed everything in your home. You tend to then replace the stuff and you hold on to things because it's hard to get rid of them. You know, you've lost everything without sort of being asked if, to, to, you know, put it simply. And, and you tend to hold on very tightly to that. Um, and those are the kind of things. Or you can have the other way. You can have come from a home where it was just over cluttered and there was just so much stuff or you weren't allowed to move around as a kid because you might break something. Then you'd probably go more on the opposite end where you hold on to almost nothing. There is nothing on the surfaces or anywhere around because, you know, that's what's come out from the past. And it's something that most uh, organizers and declutterers, professionals do have a bit of working knowledge of and help you work through it. The really good ones anyway. So clutter can also cause physical illness because of all that stuff. You're going to get dust settling because you're not able to move it and get rid of it. So it collects dust, it can get like mold if it's in the wrong place. So it can cause allergies, headaches, and even infections. So it's an important thing that we look at in nursing, especially, is our environment. And this is what we call it. We call it a therapeutic environment. A therapeutic environment is an environment that encourages healing and good health. It makes you feel better. So if you ever think about it, if you're sick and you get up and you go have a shower and you come back and your bed's been nicely made and it's all tidied up next to you, whether you're at home or in hospital, you're getting into that clean pajamas, clean bed. You, you already feel a little bit better than you did before you had that shower when you were feeling all rumpled and everything was all over the place. So that's an important thing. So what makes a therapeutic environment? It's really simple. Good lighting. 
So lighting in is an important factor in our homes and any environment. And having good lighting or appropriate lighting, whether it's windows for actual sunlight or proper lights that aren't too bright or too dim are going to cause you know, a change in your environment and make you more comfortable or, or un uncomfortable. Ventilation. So with everybody being worried about, you know, burglaries or now it's coming winter, we keep our windows closed, that's going to give you headaches. Ventilation needs to be present in every room, whether you have air conditioning or you have a window, even if it's only open a little, it is important for ventilation. It's why we tell you to go outside for a little bit, especially if you're in a room where you can't have the windows open or where, for whatever reason, getting outside into the fresh air is going to be very beneficial. Warmth is another part of a therapeutic environment. It's winter. A lot of us are cold. Some of us are lucky enough that we've got the insulation, we've got the heaters, we've got the electric blankets, but not everybody has that. And choosing the way that you're going to keep warm is going to help. And your environment is going to add to that warmth. Um, things, lots of clutter, lots of glass, those are going to drop your temperatures a little bit. But it's also not going to make you want to sit in that room. And you'll find that a room that hasn't been lived in gets very cold very quickly. Another part of our therapeutic environment is the safety. And having clutter is going to endanger your safety. It's easy to trip over stuff if there's too much. Things break, you cut yourself on the broken glass or the broken particles. So those are important things. Also, people, you know, talk, you've got a lot of stuff in your house. It sort of kind of makes you like more of a target because there's more stuff to steal, so they think. Um, and we've all watched episodes of Extreme Orders and you wonder, like, why would anyone want to break into that? But that's an extreme side. But you can see where the safety issue comes in if you've got too much stuff. It makes it more difficult to get in and out of your home in, God forbid, some kind of fire, you know, or a flood or anything like that. Um, and these are real concerns. Um, in winter, fire safety is one of the biggest issues. Um, and Hatsola does put out a warning in winter about open fires, gas fires, and gas bottles because of this very reason. Um, I just wanted to say, if there's any questions, just type them up or hold them to the end and I will cover them then. So let's see, how do you know you have clutter? Now, we don't see all that much difference in the two photos next to each other. The difference comes in how it was arranged and whatever didn't fit in that cupboard had to be removed. So you can see on the left, there's medication, there's uh, the drain cleaners, there's the first aid kit. There's all sorts of stuff that really have nothing to do with being in your bathroom. So by arranging things into little containers that are appropriate for the items. So what we did with this house was, you can see on the left, on the, the right-hand picture on the left is all the hair care products and skin hair products while on the right is the body care products. And then below we've got other, you know, extra, the larger things that didn't fit in as well as the shaving and the hair cutting kit. So that's more or less how you're going to organize a cupboard, but you need to organize it so it suits you. So please remember that everybody's house is going to be different. You can admire the pictures of somebody's beautifully organized cupboard, but it may not work for you. So for those who have teenagers, this is quite appropriate. My room's not dirty. I just have everything on display like a museum. Um, and that it does happen in a lot of homes. In fact, I posted the 10 tips on how you know you've got clutter. This was one thing that quite a few people commented on, that if their teenagers would just move out, the clutter would be gone. Unfortunately, we need to teach our teenagers how to sort their stuff. Um, because when they move out, they take the history with them. So 10 signs that you have a clutter problem. You keep buying stuff to organize the clutter. I was guilty of that. I had lots of containers, just nothing in them. You think you need more storage because everything is overflowing. 
you keep losing things because you've put it down somewhere and it's got lost. And this doesn't even have to happen in these extreme cluttered homes. It could be in a drawer, just a plain drawer. You've got too much stuff in the drawer, you put something in it, it's gone forever. You'll only find it again when you don't need it or have replaced it. You have a junk drawer. How many people have that? Um, I got rid of mine, I refused. When you've gone on a trip and you come home, you actually don't need to unpack immediately because, well, you've still got enough stuff in your cupboard to wear for a few more days. You're embarrassed about the state of your house. Now, this can apply to people whose houses are actually quite tidy um, and that's just their nature. But when your kids are embarrassed to bring friends and family home, then you know there's an issue. Laundry sits everywhere except in your cupboard. There are two reasons for this. One, you can't fit it in the cupboard anymore because you haven't cleared out your cupboard for a long time or it just, you don't get round to it. And that's part of the depression part where you look at this pile of laundry and you think, I'm not packing it away. Also, no such thing as a flat surface. Every flat surface has something on it. Drawers and cupboards, can't or don't close and you haven't decluttered in more than a year. So those are the 10 signs you may have a clutter problem. So where do you start? Well, my superpower is holding on to junk for years and throwing it away the week before I need it. I'm sure that resonates with quite a few people. Okay, so where do you start? Well, you can start anywhere, but not everywhere. Don't try and declutter an entire house in a day. For those who've tried that, you will know that all it does is make more mess and overwhelm you. You just like have no idea what you're doing. My suggestion is always to start, choose one place and set up a schedule and start there. One of the things you can start with is either starting with a room where you feel the most overwhelmed by the clutter or leaving that to the last. That, those are the two things. And it doesn't have to be a room. It could be a drawer, it could be a box, it could be a cupboard, it could be anything that overwhelms you and you just don't wanna look at it. The feelings that are around what you are going to declutter. If it isn't stuff that is going to cause you pain to declutter, then maybe have someone come with you and help you. If it is something that you're going to be doing, if you're angry or whatever it is, that's often a great time to declutter. I clean beautifully when I'm in a bad mood. Just I need to get it sorted and done. So feelings do play a part on where you're starting. But if you're not feeling motivated, the best way to start is with something small. It can just be um, something as simple as your makeup drawer you know, looking at how long you've had something and getting it rid of it. There's no sentimental value attached usually to makeup, so it's easy to get rid of. Sentimental items should always be done last. The reason is because of the emotions around uh, decluttering. It, especially like pictures and stuff like that. So that's an important thing that we need to look like, at. Okay. Uh, Mervyn asked about his desk and his study. I'm going to cover that um, right at the end. I have a fantastic suggestion that I have now implemented for myself. Um, and I will get it for, and show it to you now, especially if you're really bad at filing. Um, it's the perfect solution. Oh, let's go on to the next. Oh, why is it not? My slide seems, there we go. Right. What method works best? Each of us has to choose a method that works for us, for the way we are. Um, if you're somebody with ADHD, doing anything longer than 15 minutes is not going to work for you. Um, so if you can afford it, get a professional, but just remember the professional is still going to need you with them because that you have to decide what you're getting rid of and what not. So the box method, that's, I love that method. Um, it does make it a little difficult, um, but there is a trick around that. So the box method is four boxes. Donate, sell, 
trash and belong somewhere else. So this is why I'm saying start in one place and work your way around. The donate is, you can donate almost anything. Stationery is needed at charities, if you've got baby clothes, if you've got adult clothes, shoes, office equipment, places need it. And there are a lot of places to give it. Um, I have a list of them on the slideshow. The Marie method. She has become the big in thing. Okay, I think the only people who are taking over from her was a Netflix show called The Home Edit, but they are professional organizers and can come in, kick you out and rearrange your home. So the Marie method is this. It's the Japanese method of decluttering. You hold an object that you own, and if it does not bring you joy, you throw it away. Now, Con uh, Marie Kondo, who's the Marie method, does not say throw it away. She says, thank you. You must thank the item for its service to you and then put it in the donation box or the throwaway box because you need to treat it with respect. With uh, Kramajan, she has so far thrown out all the vegetables, the electric bill, the scale, a mirror, and her treadmill. Um, and this is the thing. Bringing joy, you know, I can hold an item clothing and go, well, yeah, and it doesn't feel like anything. But some of us have beautiful memories attached to an outfit we wore, or we have bad memories attached to an outfit we wore. So be very careful with that. But clothing is the best place to start because it is the least sentimental, um, you know, and easiest to do. Remember that if it is more than two sizes too big or too small, it's time to get rid of it. Uh, the 15 minute timer, like I said, for people with either very busy schedules or who suffer from ADHD, 15 minutes is all you're allowed. 10 minutes is the actual decluttering and five minutes is putting the stuff where it belongs. So you take a drawer, um, your junk drawer, and you spread everything out and you sort it. What needs to stay in that drawer because it's useful in the room that it's in? What needs to go to another room? Now, you do not get up and take it to the other room until the end, because if you leave the room, you're not going to finish. What needs to go in the dustbin? After 10 minutes, you're going to take the stuff that needs to go to the other room and put it in the other room. It doesn't have to get sorted. You will get there when you carry on. Then there's the option of going minimalist. Okay, this is not my thing, so I can't really talk about it. But a minimalist person is sort of, they have as little as possible because they want clear surfaces, they want open spaces, and they don't want material possessions. They don't need material possessions. So going into their home can sometimes, if you're a person who likes sentimental things like photos and pictures and things on counters or lamps, you know, that just are ornamental. Walking into a minimalist home can feel like walking into a modern art museum. There's nothing there. And the last option is to get a professional. Now, a lot of the professionals will, um, their hourly rate is quite expensive and you do need to be with them because they're going to ask you personal questions and they need to know what to keep, what they really can't get rid of. Um, and then they will try and talk you into getting rid of stuff that they know you don't actually need. Um, and they are great to work with if you can do that and if you can afford that. Once you've done your decluttering, how do you get rid of it? Like, what do you do with all of it? Well, you can either feel good or feel rich or both. So the feel good is donate. The feel rich is sell on Facebook. Donations, Yadaron, Salvation Army, any of the orphanages, places like Angel Network, all of those, they can tell you what they need, whether it's clothing, it's food, it's um, office equipment, house furniture, things like that. These places always need it. Then to sell online, Facebook Marketplace, and I mean, you can sell pretty much anything. I sold a broken dishwasher, broken wash, uh, tumble dryer, and a broken urn, and two broken fridges on Facebook. And I was honest and upfront. I said they were broken. But how do you know what you're going to charge for that? So with Facebook Marketplace, eBay, and Bid or Buy, 
If it is secondhand, you can only expect 20% of your purchase value. Okay, nothing more. Etsy will only take vintage. So if you've inherited stuff and it is now older than 60 years old, you are able to sell it on Etsy. It's an online shop that you can create. Or if it's homemade or handmade. So if you've got jerseys made by your gran, you can sell those. And then there are Facebook and WhatsApp groups. There are lots of them out there. There's Craigslist for, there's um, WhatsApp group is what's happening. There's Johannesburg group, wherever you live, there's something available, whether it's on WhatsApp, Facebook, and now Telegram. So plenty of places to get rid of your stuff um, and to earn some money out of it. Why not? If you need money, then that's a great place to, to do it. Right, here are the rules on decluttering. The first rule is what works for you. Don't try to declutter in a way that you've seen on TV or something if it really doesn't resonate with you. Decluttering is a very personal thing. Um, one of the methods that I've used is to take a black, black trash bag and walk around and anything I've seen on the surface that is rubbish goes straight in there. So I've done the whole house, but I actually haven't sorted anything. I've just got rid of the surface. Okay, so that's an important part. And that's a step that might work for people. Other people, it's not going to work at all because I don't know what to throw away. The other tip is you can only do your own stuff. Don't try to declutter your husband's things, your wife's things, your children's things. Um, you don't know the importance that they attach to certain things. I know of somebody who actually became a hoarder because of that. The parent moved and sold a whole lot of the child's things or gave it away, I think because they were downsizing, but didn't discuss it with the child. And even though the child didn't need it for a couple of years, as an adult, they wanted the stuff and they asked, well, where is it? Oh, no, I gave it away. They now no longer get rid of stuff because you never know who might need it or they want to pass it on to their children. So that's an important thing. And that's why your past can affect your future. The rule is two in, one out. So if you are a shopper, you love your shoes, you love your um, for me, it's my kitchen gadgets. You can only buy one, something if you get rid of two other things. That is the rule. And it works really well with clothes. Um, so if you've got two things that you want to get rid of, you need, or that you've got something that you want to buy specifically, um, and it could be anything. It could be a new TV even. You need to get a rid of two things that are going to take up the same amount of space. That's it. The other choice is no more stuff. Stop buying. Um, I did a challenge last year, which actually was quite easy, but that was because of lockdown, was no new clothes for an entire year. Nothing. Couldn't even go to a secondhand shop and buy stuff because that was considered new. So that, that's an important thing. And then schedules. Now that sounds very funny. When you are choosing a room to declutter, draw up a schedule of how you're going to declutter it. Um, I like to start and work clockwise in a room. So as you walk in the door, you start on your um, left-hand side and you work your right way around or you start on your right-hand side, whichever way the door is. And you walk, work your way slowly around a room. So in a room where I'm sitting now, there is a desk on my right that would be the first thing I would do. And I would start with the drawers closest to me, working my way through the drawers and then moving on. Then I would move to what's in front of me, which is a printers and papers and stationery. So I would clear that out and see. Highlighters that don't work anymore. Um, staple boxes that are empty or you've got one or two loose staples. They're not gonna fit in your stapler. Get rid of them. There's no re to, reason to collect them anymore. Envelopes that can't seal. So unless you have glue or sticky tape to seal them, why are you keeping them for? Recycle them, save your planet. Um, one of the things I cleared out the other day were old camera, um, you know, that we used to put in the camera, um, the film. We don't even know what's on them. And it costs too much to develop. And they've been sitting in a drawer for 25 years. There's no need to keep them. 
So that's an important thing. Draw up a schedule that's going to work for your lifestyle. So you're starting in your office, say, then go. Monday, I'm doing the left-hand desk drawers. Tuesday, I'm doing the right-hand desk drawers. Wednesday, I'm doing the filing cabinet, shelf one and two. Thursday, I'm doing shelf three and four. However, it's going to work for you. And whether it takes you a week or two weeks, doesn't matter. As long as you start to see the progress. And that's an important thing. So now, um, right. Anybody who needs to book a session, I'm going to put that up in the chat. And then I'm going to answer any questions that anybody might have. So um, there is how to book the free appointment. And it's 30 minutes where we talk about ideas on how you can declutter and get rid of and organize your space for a little bit. So let me see how you, I can help you. I'm just going to go off screen for a second because I wanted to answer Mervyn's question. Okay. I am really, really bad at filing. I have a hundred of empty files and a big pile of paper. So I solved my solution. Um, you can't really see because of the screen. Uh, there we go. Got to hold it at the right angle. These little see-through envelopes. I love them. The plastic envelopes with the clip. I have them um, for categories. So I've got one for client work. So each client gets their own. I have one for any online training that I'm busy with, uh, that I'm learning from. And I have a separate one for any ones that I'm giving. So the printout of this talk will be in that one. So I can use it for future reference. Um, and that's one way to do it. To do your bills that way as well is an important thing as well. Um, to have a look at um, putting your bills all together. And I would have two for that. I would have paid and unpaid. And what you do is you, as soon as you pay it, you move it into the paid one. And you can have one for the month. You, can, you don't need these plastic envelopes. You can buy paper ones and just have a month on it. And you can say bills, May. And everything from May goes in there and then into a plastic container, please not a cardboard box. Because if you're going to be keeping it for a long time, the cardboard will get fish moths and it gets damaged. If there's a reason you need to keep it like for tax, then plastic storage is better. Um, and that, that's an important part. Um, you know, what's the name? That's an important part of decluttering and sorting your papers. If you're really good at filing, then get files that work for you. If you like a lot of color, then get files that are colorful and have a different category for each file, like a color for each file. Um, and those work well for people and you can get different kinds. Like I said, I am really, really bad at filing, so I don't even do that. If you like um, digital rather than paper and you have the ability, scan your documents, save them to your Google Drive um, or any kind of cloud drive that's really useful. It's saved for life. So whether you lose your computer, you lose your phone or anything like that, it's there forever. And that's something that's nice to do with photographs, sentimental photographs especially. If you scan them on, they're on there forever um, and you can get rid of the, the, the photographs if you want to, or you can put them somewhere. The other thing with storing stuff is remember that the stuff that you need to keep but don't need access to can be put out of the way where you can't access it that easily, but it's out of the way, it's unseen. So if you're going to store it in a cupboard, just make sure that the cupboard actually can close because that's an important thing to try and fix. Um, right. So your, cl your clutter on your computer. Okay. My husband knows I'm going to mention this one. My husband has 3,000 unopened emails because he signs up to all sorts of training, all sorts of online magazines, and it's never decluttered. So you open this email and you just like that. Um, some, uh, please can we mute? Yeah. Somebody's got their sound on. Um, so that thanks, Tracy. 
Um, it's important that you understand that that is clutter and that is a problem um, and it does cause issues. If you are good with tech, then set up inboxes in your email that automatically sort your emails so that when you open your emails, you can see what's in which inbox. Um, and then you can decide which is important and which is not. When you get stuff that you really don't want, make it a habit that as soon as you get an email for something you signed up and forgot about, that you unsubscribe immediately so that it stops coming in. I get frustrated and, and it's really bad. I think I got my emails up, unopened emails up to 100 at one stage. I opened my Gmail and there were 100 unread emails. I nearly fainted. Um, I spent two hours unsubscribing. Don't spend two hours, do me a favor. Choose one a day. Unsubscribe from one thing a day and it'll get you better. Try and create folders in your um, documents for the different categories so that when it comes in and it's paperwork that you need, so like your bank statements, if they come digital, have a, a folder that says bank statements. And then in that folder or bank things, in that folder, if you've got more than one bank account, have separate folders, then everything is always organized and sorted. Back up, back up everything, please. Always have a memory stick so that you don't lose your stuff. Back it up to the cloud, back it up into a memory stick. It's great. Um, go through your, your computer, make it a habit, even if it's once a week for 10 minutes, to just go through and have a look at what things you haven't looked at in years and no longer need. Um, I found notes that are teaching plans from 2010 when I was still teaching nursing. Um, I'm never going to be doing that again. So I'm not sure why I have it. Okay. Uh, let me just Right. Somebody who keeps stock. Business owner, he keeps stock. Okay. That is a very important thing. It needs to be organized properly. Um, let me just unshare. Sorry. Stop share because that's that. It needs to be organized very carefully. And clear containers are a great way or shelving so that you can see what your stock is. Good labeling, very important as well. Um, that, that's quite an important thing to have so that you know what you have on hand, you know what your stock is. And something that um, I've seen done by somebody was they got these clear plastic containers. You can get them at Westpac. Um, you can even get them, I suppose, Macro would have them as well, is on the front, she like glued a hook and she had a very lightweight clipboard on and it had a list of everything that was in there. The other method is to get the clear plastic sleeves with a piece of paper that has your inventory of what's in that box. And then as you take it out, cross it off. And then that way you can keep track of your inventory, not only digitally, but visually as well. So um, I hope that helps. Um, you know, you do need to clear a space that is going to store your inventory. Yes, uh, yeah, Laurie, decluttering your phone, that is huge. Um, one of the things that I learned was we, you know, we pass our phones down to our children when we get a new one or something like that. And we got a phone, my father-in-law gave my husband his phone, but at that stage, my father-in-law was doing wound care. We gave the phone then to one of my daughters who almost threw up everywhere because there were pictures of wounds on the phone store because we hadn't restored the, dot, the, the the factory settings. So it's important that you need to know that photos on your phone, back up again, once again, Google Cloud, great, you can buy extra storage. That way, if your phone goes missing, you still have everything you wanted. All those grandchildren videos, all the cute dog pictures, funny memes that you had, important documents that you were sent on your phone. Those are important things. Um, it really is. Okay. Um, apps. If you have not used an app within three months, it's time to get rid of it. You don't need it. Okay. Um, the albums are great, uh, but I would suggest putting it into the cloud as well as a backup. Um, so setting your phone to automatically backup 
every day at a set time is a very important thing to keep you on track and to prevent you from losing your stuff. Phones get stolen all the time. Um, I think my daughter cried for three days because her phone got stolen and she had stuff on that she really was, you know, holding on to it. So that's an important thing. Right. Any other questions about decluttering, about getting rid of a cutter, about organizing your space um, that I can answer for anybody? So I'm, we still have a few minutes left. So, so Adrian, one of the things um, hmm. when I started the, the webinar this morning, I said to everybody, just look around you wherever you oh, might yeah. be, whether it's at home, whether it's at work. And as you've been speaking, I have been looking around me. And mm -hmm. I definitely mm -hmm. agree that clutter, whether it's on your phone, your laptop, in your working space, in your personal life, does cause severe stress and the tips that you've shared with us today have been so insightful into how to tackle what you potentially perceive as this mammoth task and break it down into simple steps to put things into perspective for you and to kind of sort through what you want to do first yeah. and yeah. how you want to do it so well a incredible incredible Thank tips you. that you shared and i'm sure everyone is in agreement so i want you to ask how many ladies have more than one handbag and when was the last time you went through it so a little anecdote um I, this is i'd say this is before i was married my mother needed I, for some reason she needed some cash or something and my mother is the kind you know the kind who her handbags match her outfit we started searching through her handbag and I'm going to say 40 years ago and we found like nearly a hundred rand in all the different handbags. And this is what I'm talking about where you're losing stuff. You've got too much. We don't clear out our handbags. We don't clear out our briefcases. And if you see on the parenting group, the pictures of School bags that are finally being cleared out when kids returned to school after lockdown were quite interesting. There was stuff growing in some of those bags. And this is something we all forget to do. And now that we're stuck at home, we're doing it less than we should be. And that's why you're losing stuff. I mean, how many times, like my kids tease me, they're going to get like a whistle. My son actually got me a thing for my car keys. It doesn't work. Um, I still lose them on a regular basis, but it is, you lose your, if you've got a big bag like I do, you lose stuff inside because you keep forgetting to clear it out. So I've now learned that once a week, I tip it out and you'd be amazed how much change is in the bottom of there. Um, and all the slips of paper, you know, and notes that I forgot I had and all sorts of things. I have a collection of Netcare stickers at the moment because every time I go to work, I've got to get a sticker. And I just stick them in my bag instead of on my clothes because I forget to take them off and they get washed with the clothes. Um, it, it's amazing what you find in everyday things that you are using all the time. And we don't see that as building up clutter because you're busy with it all the time. How can it be clutter? But it is. Look in your wallet, look in your purse, look in your handbag. How many tall slips do you own? And when are they from? So that's a big thing. I agree. Yeah. Adrian, I, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, do you believe that every single thing in your house should have a place? Where is the line between becoming OCD and overly obsessive with everything, you know, like a, okay. like a stationary should be in one place like is it a bit too obsessive where's the line so, uh, obsessive would turn out that if you've got stationary in one place that's great so i have a drawer that just has stationary but it's not organized it's just stationary so i know if i need something it's in that top drawer taking it ocd would be you've got all that stationary now each thing all the cookies must be together. All the black pens must be together. All the red pens must be together. The rulers must be in a straight line. So that's where it's taking it much more organized. Um, so that's one thing for like office work. You do need to have it sorted. It doesn't have to be exact. 
And that's why I like to say to people, when you start decluttering, put everything together. You don't have to have it perfect. We're not magazine. We're not living in a magazine. So unless you're naturally that way inclined, um, I went to a client recently to help her because her and her husband, it's actually causing them issues. His shirts are color code, like they are folded in a specific order. The domestic is not allowed to put away his washing at all. He does it, the pants are lined up exactly, all the dark pants together, all the light pants together, the shoes, right? it's very, very, very organized. It looks beautiful. And then you open her cupboard and she can't find a single thing. So we sorted it slightly differently with hers. I got plastic containers and she's got all her black shirt, t-shirts in one container, all the white t-shirts in another. And she's just done it. She hasn't folded them perfectly. In fact, we use the Marie method for her, which is, and she teaches it on her video where you fold it up and you roll it into like a sausage, takes up less space that way, but she's got them all together. But she doesn't have it like his cupboard where it's short sleeves, long sleeves, uh, dark pants, light pants, jackets in color code and, and going from black to blue to gray, that kind of way where it looks like a, I suppose a rainbow kind of thing. So we've kind of put it together that everything is similar. Um, and then what we did was we've got, her shelves were big enough that we could put the summer and the winter stuff together, one on top of the other. So she just changes the containers out. When it comes to winter, she takes the container for winter and puts it on top of the container for summer. And the containers don't have lids so that she doesn't have to go opening a lid because she'll never put it back. Um, and that's going to work for her, but it needed to work for her. For me, it would drive me insane, you know, um, and I'm not very tidy and organized and I am very much an OCD. I have stuff everywhere, but things belong in the room they belong in. So one of the things I teach when systemizing your house is decide on, decide on the function of that room. What is that room's function? Um, Places with small homes, some rooms are going to have multiple functions. So like your kitchen can be where the homework is done. So you kind of want to have stationery and stuff available for the kids to do their homework while you're, say, making dinner. So it serves a multiple function. But then it needs to have the containers or shelving of some sort where you can put the storage, the, the stationery into a box after homework is done. It's out of the way, but it's still available. Um, kitchen appliances that you use every day need to be close on hand. Yes, my counter has a lot of kitchen appliances on, but they are used at least once a week. Anything that's used less than that is in a cupboard where I kind of have to get the stairs to go fetch it, but it's still there. You know, that, that kind of thing. So it belongs in the right room. It doesn't have to be like super organized where everything is the same thing in the same place, at, you know, that kind of thing as long as it's together and easily accessible and fits the purpose of the room. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, Maureen? Definitely. It's a long, long answer for a short question. I think it's also relevant, very relevant for people working from home. I mean, yes. and don't work in a big house. I mean, I often mm -hmm. work on my kitchen counter, but right. you know, I, I can't. Kitchen counters and dining room tables are big for desks. Mm. But then after work, it's important to just put your stuff away. To be able to put it away. So a nice solution for that is an extra like vegetable, you know, the vegetable trays, the tiered vegetable trays, because you can put your stationery in that and it puts it usually fits nicely in a corner or under a counter or behind something. Um, and then you just pull it out when you need your work stuff. Um, so that that's an important thing. You know, that's something um, I use uh, my office is often so I had an office and then it became a storage room here at home. Um, and I actually can't work in there. There's just too many things in there. And every time I walk in to clear it out, I like walk out again. <laughs> It'll get there. But uh, there's more important stuff because it's the last room in the house and nobody except me sees it. So, so that's another thing to think about is like, how do you feel walking into your room? How do you think visitors feel walking into your house? Um, start there if you're embarrassed about your home. Start at the front where people are going to see it. You know, but don't shove things into cupboards, please. 
because then you open the cupboards and that's a health hazard because everything falls out or falls down. <laughs> Are there uh, any other questions? Mm, yeah, I, don't, I don't see anything in the chat box. Michelle. Oh, oh, Michelle, just, just Michelle. Ask Hello. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, uh, that is quite a common thing. Uh, Lego, seriously, you're not a parent if you haven't stood on a piece of Lego yet. Uh, I, I, my son is 25. I still have Lego pieces all over the place. I keep finding them. Every time I declutter, I will find another piece. I mean, he hasn't played with Lego in years. Um, I'm actually tempted to send it with him every time I find a piece. Whenever he comes home, give him the bag or what I found for the week. Um, so it's important for her. She's not finished playing with it. So maybe to give her two clear plastic boxes. One is the Lego that she has that for building for future. And one is the stuff that she's playing with that she can put intact into a clear container that she can see it. I think a lot of the kids because sort of have this feeling that if they put it away, they're not going to see it and they're going to forget about it. And that's quite a scary thing. Um, you know, that they're going to lose a favorite or treasured toy. So being able to see it or, or having it on a shelf low down where she can access it easily is possibly the best way to do it. Um, the other thing to getting kids to clean up is to give them a little bit of a notice. So you can't at the last minute say it's time to clean up at supper. It's better to tell kids, depending on their age, um, there's 15 minutes left till supper. It's time to start thinking about packing away. You go back five minutes later and you say, right, there's 10 minutes to supper. You need to start packing up. And then five minutes, how far is your packing? It's time for supper. And then that gives them that five minutes without you screaming at them, it's supper time, it's supper time, it's supper time. Um, and it makes everybody's life a little bit more easy, like controlled. Um, kids do need warning. And if you've got adults who struggle with sudden change, things like that would work as well as, you know, also, and that's why timers work really well. Egg timers are brilliant um, for that kind of thing. Because a ticking egg timer is a reminder that time is passing. Um, and then it rings. So you know it's there, you're aware of it, and then you can sort of do that for the, you know, to pass it on and to pack away. So I hope that helps, Michelle. Are there any other questions? I don't have a question, but I have a suggestion. Mm, okay. mm. How's that? How are you doing? Good, thanks. Okay. Good. So um, you keep saying get this and get that and buy this and buy that, but when money is tight, right. that can also be at a bit of a challenge. So, like for mm. example, with Michelle's suggestion, um, with your suggestion for Michelle, I would take it one step further. You can use something like the individual yogurt tubs or cottage cheese tubs, depending on what you want, and stand them in an empty ice cream container. And then let your put different colors in the different smaller containers. It also works with drawer storage for things like paper clips and safety pins yes. and map, uh, what's a pin board, pins, what drawing pins, whatever you call absolutely, them. Absolutely. Anything that you need to keep in a small container. Yes. but you want to be able to take out a big container and take it with you somewhere. Then you put the lid on, it goes back in the drawer. You can even stack them on top of each other, but just label them clearly because otherwise you end up with um, yes. no, a absolutely. Lot of open containers standing around because they've been looking for things. That, that's exactly true. Um, so what I did was um, my, my Shabbos knives and forks, the sideboard drawer, I have never been able to find a cutlery sorter that fits it. It is big. So, and if you buy two, they don't fit in, they're too big. So I would have to have that custom made. So I changed my mind. And every time we got an empty cereal box, I cut it out and it holds my knives and forks in the right order and they fit beautifully together. And depending on the length of what I needed was the way I cut the box. Um, and because it's in a drawer, nobody sees it. But if you really want to, you can make it fancy by covering it in wrapping paper. That really works. Old shoe boxes are great for storage and stuff like that to wrap those in paper to make them look nice if, you if you're going to have them where people can see them. Um, so those are good things. 
uh, when you're organizing and sorting your home, do not buy more containers until you've started decluttering. Chances are that once you've got rid of stuff, you will actually have space to put some other stuff. Um, and the word container is very specific. It contains stuff, which means when it is too full, it is time to get rid of stuff, not buy another one. Very important tip. Okay. It, there is a certain amount of can contain, and if it goes over,